All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Sales Gravy Podcast. I'm Jeb Blunt, Jr., Account Executive at Sales Gravy. And with me today, I have the Senior Vice President of Sales at Stericycle Shreddit, Mr. Ammon Woods. Uh, we got connected uh, several months ago, almost over a year ago now, and developed a relationship. I consider him a friend of mine, but he's in a position that uh, not many folks who listen to this podcast hold themselves. Uh, but many people in this podcast sell to these roles, and so it would be great great to hear uh, the strategy, the philosophy behind uh, behind that leader. So we're going to discuss what it's like to run a sales organization from that level. But first, before we get into the conversation, I want to tell you about one of our fantastic partners and sponsors, uh, Scipio. Scipio is a text messaging platform that allows salespeople to connect at scale to their audience and create real-time personal engagements that drive revenue. So if you are a salesperson looking or or a sales leader looking for a tool that allows you to engage with your prospects in a different channel so that you can get in front of them and 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 help their business. Scipio is a fantastic option. Go to scipio.com forward slash sales gravy. That's scipio.com forward slash sales gravy. Now we're getting into it. So Eamon, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself. Dude, you're you're an incredible person. Uh, just give us a rundown of uh, of who you are and uh, and and where you're from. Sure. So currently uh my name is Ammon Woods. I'm Senior Vice President of Sales at uh, Stericycle. And uh, Stericycle is mostly known for regulated medical waste. However, we also have a division that does secure information destruction. We own the company Shreddit, which most people, when I say, and we own Shreddit, they go, oh, okay, I know what that company is. <laughs> so I'm responsible for everything related to commercial for the Shreddit organization. And then also another little piece of business that we have called communication solutions, which really focuses on anything to do with patient communication and driving access into healthcare organizations. Gotcha. Okay. So, um, so let me ask you this question. How did you end up in sales? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So, uh, you know, as I was thinking through some of these questions, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to be too cliche, but, uh, you know, there's the saying, uh, I didn't choose the game, the game chose me. Um, and so growing up, I grew up in a family of seven, and I had this older brother who is a wild man. He's the type of guy <laughs> that wants to see if he can grab a real rattlesnake with his bare hands before it bites him. And so he and I were always going out and hustling. And everything from mowing neighbors' lawns for money, uh, we started a business where we went door to door and would paint the address numbers on curbs <laughs> and then try to upsell them to let us put brass numbers on their house. Um, so d d detailing cars, different things like that. And the majority of the time, my older brother would do all the talking. So he was the fearless one. He would bang on the door, do the talking. So, so I watched a lot of that and saw the rewards from that. And then as I got ready to start college, uh, I realized, hey, I need some college money. And I had a brother-in-law who was in the car business. And so I went down there and said, hey, let me try, let me try selling cars. And I learned pretty quick that I was pretty dang good at it oh. uh, to where if I did exactly what my manager told me to do, I started selling 20 to 30 cars a month and was constantly number one or number two. And then I saw the money that came with it. <laughs> and as a 20 year old kid, I was living at home, you know, getting ready to go to college and making 20, 30 grand a month. And so I was instantly hooked and I realized sales is a career where you really control how much you want to make based on how much you're willing to invest yourself. And so from that point on, I was like, Hey, this is the way I want to control what I'm doing. I want to control my income. And I was hooked. Absolutely. And, and I also the same thing The the way that I found sales was not that it, it well, it, I was really born into it more than anything else in my life. And then, you know, I tried my best to get away from sales. I'll, I told this story um, at our outbound conference a couple of years ago when I was I was in the I was in college. I was a junior in college, came back. My father said, come do a keynote uh, at uh, at outbound and tell the story of of selling uh, continuous care retirement facility. So, um, I was, I was 20 years old, 19 years old, and I got hired at this firm 
to do marketing. So I was a marketing intern and they, they had me moving papers around, grabbing coffee. I really had no, <laughs> I would just, I would just go, get up and go and, and, and sit in the closet. My, my closet was in the back of the office. It was just straight up a, a, a storage closet. I had one desk and they gave me like a, 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 a stapler or something just to, just to fiddle with. And they realized that when folks came in, these, uh, these folks who were 85 plus, they were worth a million and a half dollars or, or more. Um, they, they talked to me because I was young and I had anything to say to them. So the idea was that they would sell their, you know, they would sell their homes and their equity, and then they would buy this luxury experience at a continuous care retirement facility on a, on a college campus. And they realized they were talking to me because I realized I had nothing to say to these folks because I was 20 years old. And all I really wanted to do was like go out with my friends and like, I just got this job to get some, some money in my pocket. And, uh, and they would, but it was because I would listen to them. I wasn't doing this on purpose. I just didn't have anything to say. So I'd shut up. And so then they realized they'd let me take them on tours and I would drive them around the car and I would, I would, I would go around the campus. I'd take them to the spot and they would be telling me about, about their ailments. They would tell me about, you know, all, all the, the, their kids and their grandkids and how much I look like them and all this kind of stuff. And I would just sit in the car and drive and I'd go, yep, that's the library. Yep. And I just let them talk. I get back to the place. I wouldn't, I would say maybe three sentences the entire time. Come it's back driving to driving the- so uncomfortable. I don't want to hear about that. So, yeah, it was <laughs> It's like, okay, uh, arthritis sounds terrible. What I don't know what a 401k is, but sure, whatever you want to talk about. I had a guy get in the car with me who was day trading. He was day trading next to me and telling me about day trading. I hadn't looked at a stock market ever in my entire life. I didn't know what it was. And I uh, got back to the office, and they every single time they would say, Jeb, that was the most amazing tour I've ever had. You know what? I really would like to put a down payment on. Uh, I ended up being responsible for selling $5 million in, uh, in real estate in, in about three months just doing this right here. I, I mean, they gave me an Amazon gift card at the end of it, so I didn't get to see the money because uh, I was From a marketing intern. Closet. Yeah, a <laughs> room closet. I love it. Um, and, you know, I, I, I realized that then I was like, man, I really don't want to be in sales. But that was so much fun. Like getting, seeing how I could impact a business and, and, and impact other people's lives by, you know, just by listening to them. So that was a spark for that. You started out in the you know, car business. How, how did you get into, you know, the corporate sales game? Yeah, good, good question. So, so car sales really gave me the bug. In fact, I would sell all summer, then I'd go up to school and not have to work, live like a king. <laughs> but, but I missed it so much that I started flying back to Arizona where I was from. I'd buy a car. I would drive it up to Utah. I'd wash it, tint the windows, throw a for sale sign on it, drive it till it sold, fly back down, get another one. So I was curbing <laughs> cars the whole time as well. Uh, and then did a couple different sales jobs and uh, really – out of once I finished college, sales was the way I wanted to go. And I knew that, uh, and I didn't want to stay in car sales for my whole life. Um, cause that's a, that's a really hard business. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I wanted to have a family and those guys don't get to see their families all that often. So, um, so I switched gears and I uh, actually was going to go and work for Pfizer pharmaceuticals. And the day I had accepted the job, there was a position that came open at a company called affiliated computer services which was a business process outsourcing company in, in Kentucky. And they said, Hey, do you want to interview for this job? And I said, well, I just accepted one. And they said, well, just come in and talk to the guy. I said, all right, well, look, my philosophy is I'm always happy to have a conversation. So I went and met with the guy. And at the end of the interview, he said, I want to hire you for this base sales role. So it's an account management role, managing healthcare payers. And then you have to sell X millions of dollars a year within your sandbox. And once you're up to speed, you can live wherever you want. And so I started weighing it and I said, okay, Pfizer, if I want to be promoted at some point, I'll have to go live somewhere cold that nobody wants to live because <laughs> that's the territory that'll be open. Or I could take this job and live wherever I want once I'm up to speed. So I called Pfizer back and accepted the job or told them, thanks, but no thanks which was not fun. And then I took this other position. So uh, I really came up through ACS. I spent about 10 years there in different parts of the business. I stayed in that role for about three years and really learned healthcare. And then kind of my philosophy as a sales guy was if there's other parts I can learn or other parts of healthcare specifically that I can learn, I'll be the first to raise my hand. So I moved to a couple of different areas within, within ACS over the years. I did a hunter role. I ran sales ops. I got into our finance and accounting outsourcing as a hunter. 
So a bunch of different things that just helped me be a little more well-rounded. So that's sort of, you know, I, I knew I didn't want to be in car sales forever. And that was sort of the next, the next opportunity presented itself. Gotcha. Okay. So I think the lesson to learn there is, is uh, as a salesperson, your job is to be a trusted advisor 100% of the time, which is a really difficult task because we want to have to understand somebody's business and tell them that we understand their business without telling them that we understand. Because I think the kryptonite of sales is telling people that we understand when we really don't. Like, there's no way that I could step into your shoes for real and say, you know, uh, you know I understand as the SVP of a large organization, that's just not my role but I can show you how I have learned what challenges you may face. And then if those resonate with you, we can have a deeper conversation. So learning, think, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I think, I think you nailed it. And, and, and here's, here's an example of that. So good salespeople, you're spot on. They listen, which is what you did and why the senior citizens loved you. And then it's identifying what's the problem What's the problem statement? And then coming back and saying, okay, based on what I have in my toolkit, how do I solve that? And how do I present that to you? And so one of, one of the things that really helped me over my career is I didn't start out selling a physical product, right? I didn't say, I did with cars, right? Here's the car, here's right. this, it's this. And, you know, I had some tips and tricks for car sales that <laughs> probably weren't even fair. Uh, that's a whole nother topic, but as I got into business process outsourcing, it was solutions. It was technology and solution. There was no one size fits all. It was always a customized solution based on what I could find out their actual problem was. And so I think learning to think that way as a salesperson versus going with a preconceived notion of I'm going to sell them this pen and I only know it does this, these things really well. I think flipping it on its head and starting with the customer first and, and working backwards is, is really key to being a good salesperson. I agree. I, I was, I was having a conversation with a prospect earlier today and I was having this exact conversation where the sales people have this crutch and it's, and it's across the board. It's not, it's, it's human. It's, it's not that there's anybody out there who's doing it on purpose, but we have this idea that we have to know the product or the service nuts to bolts, everything about it before we can sell it because it makes us feel more confident. But I think what that does as a, as a trusted advisor is it puts us in a position where you do, you do the thing where you have the pen and it does a, a couple of things like it writes your name really well and it clicks, right? So then we try and find with our, our clients or prospects, we say, okay, how can I uncover the problems that match the pen rather than saying, okay, how can I build a pen that matches, you know, my client's challenges, which is where most solution selling comes from. Like that, that's, that's where you make your magic. As you, as you go forward, you have to be the person that they go to and say, Hey, I've got this challenge. How can you help me out rather than, Okay, I have I, I don't really have these challenges, but you, you came up with these, so let me buy this product and see if it works, right? That's commodity selling. Yeah. yeah, and I think if people even if they're even if you sell products, right? If you think about whatever you sell, whether it's products, services, software, if you think of all the things that that you have in your your toolbox to sell, if you think of those as ingredients and then you uncover the problem and look at that as the recipe. But now I can go and say, okay, now that I understand your problem, you need this ingredient, this ingredient, this ingredient, and then you're then you're putting together a solution that solves their unique problem. Right. And they could they could have right all my procurement guys roughly care about the same things. However, I can tweak the recipe a little bit, the base recipe, and, and get them to where they feel like it's a customized solution. Exactly. It's all, it's all in the little details and the margins, right? So as a salesperson, if you're in the game long enough, I can pretty much go to anybody in a sales leadership role and, and, and can, and can tell you that they're probably facing these number of challenges. But the thing is everyone believes they're unique and, and I believe I'm unique as well. That's, that's how we, that's how we feel. And, and the way we talk about our challenges are unique. And as a salesperson, you have to flex to that, to that conversation and then 
from there you can build solutions. So yeah, you, you, you went through the, the, the career change and you went from B2C to B2B. You, you sold a bunch of cars and then you sold a bunch of healthcare and then you went and learned the business. When did you transition into a leadership role and what were some of those challenges that you faced as uh, going from like a hunter role to, to a leader role? Yeah, so I think probably when I, when I first sort of shifted to a leadership role, was after being in the individual contributor base sales role uh, for about three years. We did an acquisition of a company that did something completely different, but still healthcare related. And they asked me if I wanted to be the first sales guy to cross over and kind of learn it and figure it out. I was all for it. So I had the opportunity to go learn that business with the, with the promise of building a team as well. So I was sort of a player coach in that role and then moved into a sales operations role where I was an extension of the senior vice president of the financial services group, uh, where I got to take on a quasi leadership role. And uh, so I think, I think that was pretty valuable. Um, but I think as I've moved into to different leadership roles, I think probably the hardest thing for new sales leaders is to really transition from um, being a peer or a buddy, especially when it's an internal promotion and being a, being a leader and trying to balance sort of that natural instinct of, Hey, I want to protect my team with now I've got to see the big picture of the company. I've got to try to do what's fair and equitable for my team, but also advances the company. So I think you have to sort of, switch that as well. I think one of the other things that's hard for new leaders and was challenging for me personally was learning to delegate. Okay. So, so I'm a fixer, right? <laughs> I just want to, as soon as I see a problem, boom, I want to just jump on it and, um, you know, take over and do it myself. Uh, you know, I, I talked about affiliated computer services coming up through that company. And I think at the time ACS was the, best sales company to, to learn from. I mean, they were, they were fantastic. And at ACS, we had a set of principles called the sunshine principles. And they were called the sunshine principles because sunshine helps things grow. So there were these 10 principles. And the very first one is one, I'm the one. Uh, I own the problem, I'll solve the problem. I will make sure it gets solved. And so I think as I moved into a leader, I had to really focus on that third piece Right. I'll make sure it gets solved. Yep. Right. If I can solve something myself, but, but making sure that I, I delegate it and, 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 and then hold people accountable. Gotcha. So, so uh, let's dive into that, that philosophy a little bit more. I think that what I've seen from sales leaders and, and I, I'm going to defer to you on this because I don't have that experience is that there is that need. And I, I have that too, cause I'm an individual contributor, but it's all on me you transition and you, you struggle with that because then you become the person who's um, you become the chief problem solver, right? So all your salespeople end up getting dependent upon you to jump in and solve the issues. Uh, what, what strategies have you employed to sort of break that tie to, to, to create a, a healthy environment where people know how to solve their problems and they can come to you and bring you in when it matters. What have you, what have you seen that works the most? Yeah. So, so I've had to set really clear boundaries and, and really train my next level leaders and my teams that to have an opinion. They're probably all, if they're listening, they're going to roll their eyes and be like, <laughs> Oh my God. But I would say, have a, have a dang opinion. Like if you come to me, don't just drop a you know, hot steamy turd on my desk, like come with an opinion. Here's the problem. Here's what I think we should do about it. And then let me react to that. Uh, and I tell them, trust your, your instinct. And most of the time I trust my leaders and I'll say, great, go do that. When they come to me with a problem and there's nothing else, I'll go back and say, Hey, go, go form an opinion and come back. Yep. So I've, I've had to really work pretty hard at that. Uh, but I've gotten to the point where now they know if they come to me with something, right, they better have at least an opinion about it. Oh yeah, I I had this. Uh, I had to learn this lesson really hard. Uh, I was an intern at this really large sales organization, and I was doing 
basically SDR work where I was picking up the phone a hundred times a day, setting appointments with people that I had no idea what I was talking about. I was talking to chief financial officers about uh, employee benefits and HR solutions. And I had no idea what I was talking about. One guy, he picked up the phone. It was my first week. I called him and I said, um, you know, Hey Ammon, it's Jeb Blunt Jr. at XYZ company. I, I'm calling to set an appointment with you because I help businesses uh, lower their I- or increase their EBITDA and lower their employee benefits costs. And he said, Jeb, how are you going to do that? And I went, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm meeting with you. I'm meeting with you. <laughs> and he said, Jeb, you're not going to do very well at this job. Um, but uh, but three weeks later, I actually set that appointment again. He, he didn't remember who I was, and uh, we ended up closing that deal. So I'll I'll, I'll win uh, win that one. But I had this I had this situation where I set an appointment with somebody, and then I double booked my my account executive. And I was really I had I had really high anxiety about this, and I went straight to the sales manager and. Uh, uh, my, you know, my account executive was saying something like, I can't do both, figure it out. She's just like being really rough on me. Went to the sales manager and just said, hey, I've got this problem. And my sales manager looked at me and said, what are you going to do about it? And I just stuck. I had no idea. I hadn't even thought that far. I just knew I had a problem. Went to the sales manager and just get, threw it on their desk, threw that hot steamy turd right on their desk. And, and she looked at me and said, right what are you going to do about it? Um, and I learned this lesson, I learned to articulate this lesson in another way because um, actually Jeffrey Gittimer told me this, uh, is that never go to a boss with a problem and no solution, right? Think about that opinion. Go to them with with what you think the best route is and then let, like you said, let them react to that and that's the best way to, um, you know, to, to lead your conversation. And as a sales leader, I guess you have to set that boundary. So what, uh, what, what were some of the things you have to tell your leaders in terms of setting boundaries to to keep that conversation uh, there rather than just becoming a problem solver? Yeah, so let, let me make one comment, then I'll, I'll get to that because you just gave me a thought. I mean, it, that's the same thing that our customers want as well. Yep. They want us to have an opinion, right? yep. especially for those who are in sort of account management, you know, land and expand roles. When you have an opportunity to show up for a QBR, they don't want you to just read the news to them. They want you to have an opinion and share with them, act like the expert. Right? And so I think it's the same things we want is we want people to have an opinion, but our customers want that as well from us as salespeople. So, um, you know, I, I think that as far as, you know, strategies that I've employed, it's, it's constant. It's, it's modeling. So when I go to them, right? With something, I'll typically make sure that I have an opinion. When they see me go to my boss, they don't see me just, you know, I got a problem. Good luck. <laughs> right? They've learned that if they send me an email that says see below, it's coming right back to them. I don't do see below. I don't have time to try to scroll through nine emails and figure out what do you want? And so, uh, I've even gone as far as my, my EAD, who you know, uh, got them all on a call the other day and said, okay, when you send something to Ammon, it's bullet points, put in the subject what you want. Do you need his approval? Do you need, right, let's, let's speed this up. Otherwise, it's going to get buried or lost. So it's really been a combination of modeling the behavior. When I see it, correct it. Don't respond and then try to correct it just go and come back when you're ready yep right so they won't so they start to know and just over time it's been something i've had to really stick to and and it's worked really well and then i see it happening you know down leadership lines as well which has been great okay so then you know what do you believe is the role of the leader to an individual salesperson or to, uh, you know, uh, uh, someone who's a tier below you in the sales organization, given that you are modeling the behavior and then correcting it when you see it, what is the role of a sales leader? Yeah. So I'm a big believer that, that sales leadership really should view their role as existing to work for the sales teams and not the other way around. Yeah. I know servant leadership's a big buzzword, but I felt this way forever. Right? My my job is to one set and communicate a clear strategy, uh, direction, expectations. Second, make it easier for the teams to sell. 
right? Either removing internal roadblocks, investing in sales enablement tools, training. My job is to make it easy for the team, for the individual contributors. Number three, hold people accountable in the entire organization, not just my team, but hold myself accountable, hold operations accountable, hold everybody accountable. And then I think the, the fourth thing that a lot of sales leaders, especially as they move up, is they forget that they need to spend time with individual contributors in the field. That's my favorite part of the job. The rest of my job completely goes to heck when I do that <laughs> because I get so focused and I love going out and selling with the teams, but it's invaluable. I can see firsthand challenges they might be having. What are customers saying? Do we have gaps in our solutions or services? Uh, are there things that we need some refresher training on across the board? Are there best practices that one team is doing that we should all be doing? Right? Or, there, or is there just some general refresher stuff that needs to take place? So, you know, I think as a, as a sales leader, we need to flip that org chart on its head and really view ourselves as how do I enable Jeb Jr. to go out and sell more business, make more money, and, and kill it? Yep. Yep, I, I think that that is exactly what anyone who has uh, sales leadership or a good sales leadership experience would say is that your job is to enable everyone else to be successful, right? And the more successful they are, the more successful you will be in return. And so I like the what we talked about. So there's that management piece, like removing the roadblocks, you know, you know enabling them to, to do their jobs, put, putting in tools that, that gives them the best, uh, you know, the, the best probability to win. And then of course, you know, helping them with, uh, with messaging and just tactics and, and making sure that they're running the process correctly. That's that management piece. Then the leadership piece of that modeling and then, and then correcting behavior as you see it. So it drives everyone in the same marching order, getting to the same goal. But there's that third piece that people miss with, with leadership. And, and I see this as, as more folks go up, you see less interaction with people like me who are, in, you know, who are, who are actually engaging with, with your clients and prospects is that your job as a coach is to, is to help me understand my behaviors, create awareness, you know, drive conversations that matter, create trusted advisor status. You know, those are things that you have experience with that maybe I don't because I'm 24 years old and dude, I don't know anything. Like I am, I am stupid as far as it goes, but you have that knowledge and I can, you know, I can learn from you and model after that. And if you're spending time with me, I see that firsthand. And then I, then I connect with you as a leader. And the idea there is, and I, you articulated this is that you need me as a sales leader more than I need you. And that's just, you know, the philosophy that leadership should, should take on just from my own opinion. Uh, so then, you know, what then is your, given those, given those, that roadmap that you gave us of those rules to, to engagement, what kind of philosophy do you follow? Is it the sunshine, is the sunshine laws, you know, the, the, um, yeah. the, the philosophy there, like articulate that a little bit for us. Yeah, so I, I think those are definitely, and I can, I'll share those with you at some point because there's, there's 10 of them, but um, they're, they're pretty basic principles. But I think, you know, as, as leaders, and I'll, I'll just wait one more point, it's hard as a, as a leader, the higher you go and the bigger your organization goes, to get out with each individual right. and spend time. So sometimes you'll have people feel a little bit neglected. Why didn't he come out with me or that type of thing? But good leaders, as long as they're getting out and, and experiencing it, they're, they're doing the right thing. Uh, I've got a sales org of over 500 people. So, I mean, I could, there's no way I can get a ride along right. with everyone. But I, I try to uh, get out as much, you know, as much as I can, but, but I think as long as they are getting a good pulse on the different areas, they're okay. Um, from a from a from a sales leadership philosophy standpoint, you know, there's a couple sort of key principles that I, I focus on. Uh, the first one's actually one of the sunshine principles, so it's it's nine, uh, nine line. There's a thick gray line between honesty and dishonesty, and you better stay on the the honest side. Yep. Right. There's it's not a it's a pretty broad. You know if you're in the gray, right? And so I think. You know, integrity, keep your integrity at all costs. Uh, for me, that helps make decisions a whole lot quicker and easier for a lot of decisions. Right? It's pretty simple. Is it ethical? Is it right? No? Okay, we're not doing it. Next, move on. Um, 
I think the second thing that, that I really try to do is be transparent. Uh, my teams know that if they, they can ask me anything, and if I can tell them, I'll tell them. And if I can't tell them, I'll say, Jeb Jr., I can't tell you that. Uh, and I think what that's done is built, built trust to where my teams will give me the benefit of the doubt more often than not. Um, another one is inspect what you expect. Uh, you can, if you tell people or you roll something out and then you never bring it up ever again, we're salespeople. We want the path of least resistance, right? <laughs> so if I know Ammon's never going to ask me again, if I just wait long enough, it'll go away and right? I won't have to worry about it. So really being, you know, keeping people accountable and inspecting things that, that we're expecting people to do. Uh, this one is actually on your, your board behind you. Pipe is life. Yep. Uh, if you're not managing a pipeline, if you're not focused on a pipeline, you're just, you're doing this. You got no plan. <laughs> and then prospecting every day, every day, every day. Yep. If you're not, as a salesperson, if you're not prospecting, you're dead. And so as a sales leader, if I'm not fostering an environment where that is paramount, we're dead as an organization. So those are, those are a handful of things that, you know, sort of drive my behaviors and my thoughts on a daily basis. Beautiful. I, I don't have anything to add to that. I, I have no idea what I could add to that to, to bring back. I think that, that would, if you are listening to the stop, pause it, go back, listen to those principles because that's going to drive success. If you're a salesperson, that's going to drive success in your life. And as you become a manager, you're going to figure out how, how, how those principles will make your life easier, even though in instances it can be more difficult. Like that integrity piece, that, that thick gray line between, you know, uh, being truthful and a, and a lie, right? Like, you know, and I, I've, I've, you know, I've been a salesperson. I, I know this, you know, when you get into the gray area, you know, when you're, when you're falling that way. So as a, as a leader, you, you, you see that thin, that thick gray line. How do you recognize this behavior in a salesperson? And is, are there ways to correct this that aren't, you know, termination or, you know, like there's that thin, gray, there's, there's, there's shades of it. So, um, walk yeah, through that. I, you know, I think there are, and look, as we as sales people or professionals in general, you're always going to run into someone trying to push you towards that, that gray area. Yep. I mean, it's just, it's how it is since the beginning of time, human nature. So I think in, in some instances I've had, um, I'll give you an example. So I've, I've had some times where as I've come in or taken a team over, I've immediately seen stuff that I'm like, whoa, hey, we should not probably be doing that. And so as I get into it and ask questions, sometimes I learn, hey, that's the way we were taught. That's the way we've always done it, this type of thing. You know, and for some people, they instinctively know, All right, that's not being taught, but I'm not sure I should be doing that. Others, right, they're new, they're just, okay, this is our training program. Here's how we do it. Until you start talking to them and asking them questions and kind of pointing it out, they may not, the light bulb may not have even gone on. So I think in, in a lot of instances, you have folks that this is just the way I was taught. And as you start to ask them questions and, you know, say things like, well, do you think you should be paid a commission for things that you put no effort into? Would you pay somebody for that? Hmm, no, right? The light will go on and, and you can correct behavior pretty easily. And then there's just other people who they just love the gray. Yep. That's their favorite color. Right? <laughs> and you have to sort of part ways with them and, and move on. So I think, you, you know, I think you can correct that behavior. Um, but, but there's no, there's no magic to doing it. You either have to have people that want to or, right. or don't. Right. So it, it, I think, I think what I heard there is it's, it's the creation of awareness and in recognizing awareness. So if if you have someone on your team who is aware that what they're doing is probably not on the right side of things, you know, maybe they're not a good fit for your organization. But there are folks who just came into the organization, they were learning from a team that, you know, had that culture, and they had a leader at some point who just did, that's the way they did it. And they had no idea. And so once you create awareness, and they start to change that behavior. Yep. What are some gaps that you see in leadership, you know, from, from your perspective, even, even at your level, um, what are some areas that, that, that are lacking, uh, across the board? Yeah. So 
Great question. You know, a couple things I see, and I see it across lots of different organizations that I've been, is as you have people being moved into sales leadership roles, uh, oftentimes they're moving them into roles because they were a really good individual contributor. So some organizations, it's almost this unspoken rule. If you're the highest performer, you're the next whatever of sales. And it doesn't always translate. Because you were a good individual contributor doesn't necessarily mean you have the skills or capacity to be a great leader or ever be a great leader. Right. And so, you know, I think one of the ways that, that I've found to kind of get around that is we certainly have great individual contributors who can be. They're unicorns, right? But I'm a big proponent of as you go through promoting or hiring a new sales leader, you do a very thorough process. You get lots of people involved yep. um, because all of us can be great one time, two times, right? I can be a one interview wonder or two <laughs> interview wonder, but over a course of time, mixing it up, different people interviewing different things. It's hard to be on all the time. If you're not, if you're not great. I don't know what you're talking and about. So, so I run a big process. In fact, my boss, same thing for this current role I'm in. I was an internal candidate. I went through 16 interviews. Wow. 16 different interviews. And I think the other thing that does, especially if it's a, an internal promotion, lots of people get in the, in the process and have an opportunity to interview. It signals that there was a thorough process and it helps them understand, yeah, that was the right person for that job. And, and the team's buying a little bit quicker. <laughs> I, I I listened to this really interesting podcast, uh, and I, I sent over to you one of these. It's, it's a podcast by Malcolm Gladwell. It's Revisionist History, and he walks us through uh, this this hiring model, which is the highest sales performers move to the next sales whatever that might be. So they, they, the high, they take the number one person, they put them in a role with our sales manager, and they studied the – uh, the performance of sales leaders who were uh, who were number one contributors on their teams, whatever that might be. And they also took uh, a company who hired a consensus. So they brought in somebody who was probably middle of the pack. Uh, they had high empathy scale rather than high outcome scale. And they went through an interview with a bunch of people who get, who, who said, you know, this person is, is great with all of us. Uh, they pass all the bars, put them into the sales manager role. They found that sales teams that had a manager who was a Michael Jordan, right, of basketball. You can argue with me whether or not they're the best basketball. He's the best basketball player of all time. I don't know enough about basketball, but. Uh, I, you know, there you go. He, so he's the best it's ever been. Michael Jordan would probably be a terrible GM, right? He could not tell other people how to be as great as him. And he needs four other people on the court that are like kind of okay. And he can win you a championship seven times in a row. Like that's, that's how good he is, right? Those teams that were led by Michael Jordan's performed 60% less in terms of revenue than the teams that were led by somebody who was, who was uh, hired by consensus. So, I don't know what that says about sales teams, but maybe we need to look at how we hire. I, I'm just going to keep preaching that. This is one thing I've been talking about my entire little career here is how we, how we should hire sales managers. Uh, but yeah. how, how do you think that, you know, the, the gaps in, in, in that in leadership should be addressed? What are the strategies for creating awareness at a leadership re level rather than an individual contributor level? I think that I, I've seen a lot of individual contrib contributor um, just intervention, but not so much from a leadership side. So uh, what, is your, what are your strategies there? Yeah, so I, I think one of the, the other important things, um, sorry, I, a shredded truck just pulled up outside <laughs> my house. Because I'm a, I'm also a customer, so they come and pick up my <laughs> shredding. Then, sorry. Uh, yeah. So, so I think the other thing that we need to do as leaders as well to, to help grow the next, you know, next generation of leaders is we should continually be looking for our replacement within our teams and looking for people that we think have some of those traits and, and talents, and then validating that. Uh, putting them in positions to where they can take on a little more or maybe you have them sit in for you on a meeting you can't make and present information to senior leadership, right? Just putting them in different positions and see how, see how they react to that and giving them opportunities to, to be in front uh, and, and to, to stand out as a leader. So I think, I think that's one thing we need to do. 
better. And then I think there's some onus on salespeople, individual contributors as well, who want to go to the next level. They should continually be learning and being the first to raise their hand when there's a problem and say, hey, I'll take that. Hey, let me help with that type of thing as well. Beautiful. All right, so we, we're coming off the end of the, the end of the interview, and I want to ask you this last question. So uh, there is a disconnect between what individual contributors do and salespeople, in my own perspective, uh, and and the and the perspective that I have of leaders. Like they, there's there's you guys are the man. You guys are the people keeping us down. You're you're the one who are who's getting in my way of closing that huge deal because you want me to do all the things right and put everything into Salesforce or HubSpot or whatever it is. What perspective would you want to give? Um, individual contributors about your role so that they can sort of see the big picture and where you're coming from. I see you're laughing. Did that hit a chord? <laughs> you're on mute, by the way. There you go. Yeah, no, I, I love this question. And, and here's why. Um, so a couple things as I thought through this, through this question that you, that you sent me earlier is number one, first of all, I would say to individual contributors, thank you. Okay, You're, you are the lifeblood of the companies that you work for. Uh, every other part of the company hates me when I say this, but I don't care. <laughs> Everyone else around you who's not in sales is support. If all the salesmen in the world went away, growth, nothing would grow and there wouldn't be jobs and, and other things. That's a whole nother debate that I'm sure someone from operations <laughs> is going to come after me for, right? But, but so thank you. Uh, the second thing is sales leaders, the good ones, we understand that it is not easy. It's a daily grind. It's hard to do it day in and day out, always be on. It's not for the weak heart. Number three, cut your sales leaders a little slack. Okay, the good ones, they're working their guts out for you. They're trying to knock down roadblocks for you and your peers. When they make decisions, they really have to balance a lot of different things, right? They have to do what's best for the sales individuals. They have to do what's best for the customer. They have to weigh what's best for the company, the shareholders. Right? So there's a lot of things. There's the bigger picture that they see that you may not have access to. So give them the benefit of the doubt, right? And then lastly, I think, you know, my wife, my wife told me this is going to be a buzzkill, but it's lonely at the top. I had a great sales leader tell me that, Ammon, it's lonely at the top. And what he means by that is, is the higher you move up in your career in a leadership position, the less people you have to commiserate with. And the more weight you have on your shoulders to deliver results. And so at some point, you get to, to where the buck stops with you and there's no one else. And so, you know, you just have to, if, if that's what you want to do, if you love helping and serving and making great salespeople greater, and you have to realize that at some point, you know, you, you're going to have more pressure and, and you're going to have less people to complain to. So... I'll end it on that. All right, salespeople, stop judging them so much. I mean, it sounds like a plea from a guy who has a has the crown on his head, but you know, heavy is the head who wears the crown. So that that beautiful answer to that, and uh, give them some slack, give have some perspective on it. And uh, Ammon, I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for for joining us. Uh, where can people find a little bit more information about you and and uh, and connect with you? Yeah, please connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, Ammon Woods, A M M O N. Last name Woods. Uh, if you want to learn more about Stericycle or Shred It, Stericycle.com or Shredit.com as well. So, Love it. So fun to be on here, Jeb. I think, uh, and I know I sent your data video. Hopefully, it was better than the original one I sent you <laughs> when we first got started. But uh, you know, you, you've been great as a sales uh, as a sales individual contributor, and I, I think you've got a lot of potential to be a sales leader in your career. I appreciate that. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being uh, with us here at the Sales Gravy Podcast. Again, I'm Jeb Blunt, Jr., Account Executive here. If you have any questions about uh, about our, our sponsoring our podcast or joining the Sales Gravy community, head to salesgravy.com or head to salesgravy, learn.salesgravy.com, uh, and we'll be able to help you out with any of our trainings, especially with our new book, Virtual Training, that came out uh, this year that helps you understand how we built our virtual learning studios and our experience. So, so thank you everyone for joining us. I'll see you next time.